Greetings, everyone. Praise the Lord. You have entered into Grace United Methodist Church virtual worship service. And yes, I am Minister Domily Goings here to help guide us through our worship service. Join me this morning as we posture our hearts and our minds to give God all the glory and all the praise. But first, as we prepare ourselves, listen in to the upcoming announcements that are to be found in your bulletin as well, as well as our website. The weekly announcements are as follows. The Adult Virtual Sunday School is held each Sunday from 9.30 to 10.30 a.m. And at 2 p.m. today, the Youth Sunday School will also be held. We also invite you to join the Busy Bees Senior Ministry Bible Study every Wednesday at 11 a.m. And not only that, our prayer services are held on Wednesday at 6 to 7 p.m. via teleconference. And then on Thursday, please come on and join Pastor Smothers every Thursday at 7 p.m. for Bible study. We will be studying from the book of Ephesians. And all of the other announcements, please refer again to our electronic bulletin or Grace's website at gracefortwashington.org for additional details. Now, our call to worship. And I'm reading from Psalm 100. Make a joyful shout to the Lord. All you lands, serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Know that the Lord, he is good. It is he who has made us and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful to him and bless his holy name for the Lord is good and his mercy is everlasting and his truth endures for generations. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Let us pray. Gracious God, we just thank you once again for bringing us into this virtual setting as we set up our altars before you, Lord God. We just ask, Lord God, that you will inhabit the praises of your people. Guide us through this worship service. Fill our hearts with your love and your joy and your peace that surpasses all understanding. We lift your name on high, gracious God, and we celebrate who you are in our lives. We ask these things in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Wow, that was so amazing. Thank you, the Psalmist team, for taking us into worship. He has done great things for me. I don't know about you, but that is definitely my testimony. He has done great things for me. Now, as we continue to worship, join me in the reading of the scripture. The scripture is found today in John 15 verses one through eight, and I'm reading from the NIV version. And it reads, I am the true vine and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit. While every branch that goes bare fruit, he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine and you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire and burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. This is to my Father's glory, that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. And as we continue to worship, we are worshiping also through our giving. And our giving is so important to the body of Christ. Join me as I pray over our tithe and our offering. God of the far flung universe and God who is closer than our own heartbeat. We long to dwell in your closeness, abiding in you and you abiding in us. However, the call to abide in other places is strong. To abide in the world of popularity and acceptance or in the world of increasing wealth and power centered around our own wants and desires. As we offer our gifts and ourselves to you, help us. Help us turn away from, our, from other calls and abide in that place of heart's deepest desire in your son, Jesus, and he in us. In Christ, we pray. In Christ, we pray. Amen. There are a number of ways that you can give on this day. Uh, you can make an electronic giving contribution through our Give Plus mobile app. You can text the amount you wanna to give to 301-433-7385. And always you can mail your gift to Grace. Please enclose your giving envelope in a standard mailing envelope and make checks payable to Grace United Methodist Church or Grace UMC. The additional information you can find in the electronic bulletin as well. Thank you for your giving. Amen.
Gracious and loving God, we're thankful for this day. We're thankful for your presence in our lives. Lead us and guide us as we hear this word that you have prepared for us for life, for abundance, and for well-being. We pray all these things in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Well, brothers and sisters, we are still in the Easter season. Believe it or not, Easter continues. And with that spirit, we come to the message today that's titled Abiding in Christ. It's from John 15, verses 1 through 8. And you'll recall that our Gospels are Matthew, what? Mark, Mark Luke, and John. Amen. And John is different from any of the other Gospels in the sense that John approaches the biblical story by telling stories that are very different than we find in the other Gospels. The Gospel of John was written for two primary purposes. The first is to produce faith in Jesus Christ as the Son of God. There are those who are hearing the Gospel in John for the first time. So the stories that John is telling are stories that help connect people to the gospel story in a way that makes it relevant for their lives. Isn't that interesting? As much as people know about the gospel, we still have a responsibility to make it relevant for our lives. The second thing that the gospel of John does is it gives a witness to life itself through knowing that Christ is our anchor, through knowing that we abide in Christ, but also putting forth for our strengthening the promises of God. So John 20, 30, 31 puts it this way. The disciples saw Jesus do many other remarkable signs in addition to the ones recorded in this book. But these are written so that you may continue to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing in him, you will have life by the power of his name, my Lord, my Lord. So John takes an approach of really dividing for us the two groups who were the primary hearers of the gospel. He started first with the apostles of Christ, 
These were the eyewitnesses of the things that Christ had done while on earth. And then he shifted to the disciples of Christ, those who became followers and witnesses and bore witness to the teachings of Christ. Their lives were transformed by the Bible. Now, it wasn't the Bible as we know it today, but they were teachings that were passed on from faith community to faith community. And as they were passed on, believers began to say, this is the truth. And this is what we're going to live by as we move forward. So the Gospel of John then becomes a series of stories showing that the miracles of God were at work in the time of Jesus and are at work in our lives today. One of my favorite stories in the Gospel of John is the story of Jesus at the wedding of Cana of Galilee. And as you read through the book of John and you read the story, something miraculous has happened. Jesus is at a wedding. And the steward who was responsible for the food and wine said that the wine has run out. And someone said, well, tell Jesus that the wine has run out. And, and we don't know what Jesus' immediate response was, but what we do know that Jesus turned the water into wine. Now, wait a minute. Now, you'll say, what's Jesus doing messing with the beverages at the, the wedding? Listen to what's happening. This miracle, the, there, were, there were six big old containers of water there that were usually used for ceremonial purposes. But when they approached Jesus and said the wine had run out, Jesus spoke into that mere water and literally turned it in to wine. And the story goes on to say that the steward, after tasting the wine, said that the water that was turned into wine was much better than the original wine that they had. Now, we can make a lot of applications to this, but here's one that I don't want you to miss. Jesus always has a desire to show up in the ordinary places of our lives. Let me say that again, because a lot of people think that, okay, these are holy things and these are sacred things and, and the two should not meet. That's not true. We find that from the beginning of Christ's ministry on earth, he appeared in the everyday, ordinary experiences of people in a marvelous way so that he could reveal himself to us as a portion of God's manifestation in a practical sense. One of the other teachings of the Gospel of John is that this is a book about living water. And what are some of the examples of living water? Eternal life and salvation are two examples. Living water is also a sign of the Holy Spirit being present with us. And living water not only quenches our thirst, but it fulfills our spirit for more of God through Christ. Now let me unpack that. Living water is a replenishment. It is a renewal. It is a refreshing. And that's how God wants God's spirit to be rolled into our lives as something that brings renewal and refreshment. How does this manifest for us today? This looks like hope in the midst of despair. This looks like strength in the time of weakness. This looks like faith in places of doubt. And as our world is rocked each and every day with injustices, we need to be committed to understanding how this renewal takes place. I don't have to tell you, you don't have to go far to see the injustices against brown and black people. You don't have to go far to see food insufficiency. You don't have to go far to see economic hardships or homelessness or the consequences of a lingering pandemic and the impact all of these things are having on our children and youth. We are in need of living water, of a relationship with Christ more than ever. That living water manifests in our lives as the Spirit of God reminding us that God sent God's Son into the world to bring us renewal and refreshment. We gain our strength to survive in the midst of all of these things in our personal 
and our private worship. Let me say that again. Our personal and our private worship. I know there are some people who say, I'm going to church, I'm going to church. And they don't believe that they're in worship until they come into the church building and they see the ushers, they hear the choir singing, they hear the preacher preaching, and they say, oh, we had good worship today. But the more we mature in Christ, the more we realize that to really have an extraordinary worship experience, it has to begin long before we get to the building. Because we have to be worshiping God when we get up and get in our vehicle and head towards the church house. Because that's when we are tuning in to the spirit of God, revealing God's spirit in our lives. That's also the way that we tune in to how God uses us as witnesses to hear God's nudging when God is saying to us, speak a word of hope into this person's life. Let this person know that no matter what their circumstances are, that I am with them. Worship is not just limited to a place. Worship is a posture. Worship is a position. Worship is a promise. And worship is knowing that God is with us all the time. You know, the Gospel of John also is full of powerful teaching about the revelation of Jesus and how Jesus' revelation manifests as worship. John 6.48 says, I am the bread of life. John 8.12 says, I am the light of the world. John 10.9 says, I am the door. John 10, 4 says, I am the good shepherd. John 10, 11, 25 says, I am the resurrection and the life. John 14, 6 says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And John 15, 5, out of our primary text today, says, I am the vine. As you look at our text today, this John 15, 1 through 8, we are reminded that the main point of the sermon today for all of us is that there is this place that we come to where we move from being external to God's promise to becoming internal to God's promises. The Gospel of John reminds us that if we focus on John, we become not only disciples, but we become fruit-bearing disciples. And what does fruit-bearing disciples mean? It means that the gospel is no longer abstract. The gospel is no longer far away, that the gospel is internal, the gospel is close, the gospel is felt by us in a way that there's no doubt in our mind that it is real. You know, God desires for us to have fruit, and that fruit is just simply evidence of our relationship with God. You know, God desires us to have works, and works are the tangible evidence that our discipleship is a work of things to do with our relationship with Christ. Now, let me unpack that. If we bear fruit by the evidence of our relationship and gain faith, it is then that faith that translates into service and witness and the acts that we do through worship and testifying and evangelizing to other people. So works and faith go together as we look at what God is trying to reveal to us. You know, God's desire, one of God's heartfelt desires is for us to worship. Because while we worship, we are acknowledging God as our Savior, as our Creator, and as our Comforter. And that's why worship is so important. True worship doesn't require choir. True worship doesn't require a band. True worship doesn't require anything external. True worship is what happens when you and Christ are communicating with one another. John 15, 5 puts it this way. I am the vine and you are the branches. Those who remain in me and I in them will produce much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. In other words, we are connected to the vine. The vine is Christ. And as we are connected, we become healthier. And in our health, we then produce more fruit. One of our main objectives as disciples is to bear fruit. And bearing fruit is our confession that Christ is our Savior and Lord. And when we connect through confession of our sins, acceptance of forgiveness, 
and committing to become a disciple, that brings about joy in our lives. In our discipleship, there are other things that are the evidence of that connectivity. In discipleship, we share our witness with others, service and mission involvement. And that brings happiness because as we are used as instruments to reach out, to touch other people's lives, it brings joy and happiness to our lives. And thirdly, praising God through giving and generosity. And a lot of times when people hear these statements, they think only about dollars, nickels, and dimes. But praising God through generosity is giving of our time, our talents, our gifts, our service, and our witness. It is a powerful movement. It is a powerful breakthrough. It is a powerful knowing how God is at work in our lives. So how do we get there? John 15 and 7 says, but if you remain in me and my words remain in you, you will ask for anything you want and it will be granted. Let me say that again because somebody needs to hear that. John 15 and 7. But if you remain in me and my words remain in you, you may ask for anything you want and it will be granted. Or the contemporary version of this text puts it this way. But if you make yourselves at home with me and my words are at home in you, you can be sure that whatever you ask will be listened to and acted upon. Brothers and sisters, this is how my father shows who he is. When we produce, we become mature. And when we become mature, then we're able to spread our fertile Christian experience to others. John 15 and 4 in the message puts it this way. Live in me. Make your home in me just as I do in you. And if you do this, the harvest is sure to be abundant. Do this by living in God's word. It's the key to your abundance. And what does abundant harvest mean? Because that's our goal. You don't just want to be a mediocre Christian or a mediocre believer. You really want to show some abundance. You want to see some fruit being born. So what are three things that are the evidence of getting to that abundance in Christ? First of all, you have to know that we are being pursued by God. Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. God is pursuing us every day. God is after us. God is, is, is literally following us around, looking for an opportunity to reveal God's self to us because destiny awaits you. Let me say it again. You want to know what God's agenda is? God's agenda is to reveal the best that God has in store for us through our relationship with God. Number two, abundant harvest occurs when we are protected by God. What does this mean? Safety and covenant cover you. How many of you know that many times hurt, harm, or danger could have come to your life, but you were covered by the blood of the Lamb? That is, Jesus, the Holy Spirit, God, our Creator, intervened and prevented you from experiencing hurt, harm, and danger because we are protected by God. That's part of the abundant harvest that we're talking about. And number three, we are provided for by God. Provision and providential resources. And my friends, let me stay here for a minute because I believe that this is the point that a lot of believers miss. When you are deeply rooted and connected to the vine, you can expect provision and providential resources. What does that mean? Provision means that God already knows what our needs are. God has anticipated what our needs are and God is positioning resources to bless us at the opportune moment in our lives. Providential resources, those are the extra that God puts aside that speak into our scarcity because when we know that God is looking out for us, scarcity for believers is just an illusion. We have no scarcity if we are rooted in God. You can trust God to keep God's word. Now, how do we get there? You can simply say, God, I'm ready to surrender to this new season in my life. Let me say it again. 
I am ready, God, to surrender to this new season in my life. I'm ready to receive whatever you have in store for me. I release my failure from the past and pick up your plans for my future. And when you make those two statements, what you are saying is, I'm not in control of this. God's in control of this. And I accept and receive God's plan for my life. Brothers and sisters, these things we can depend on. Let us pray. God, I surrender my doubt, my hesitation, and my fear to launch into the future in faith. God, help my unbelief. Help me move beyond my worry, my hesitation, and my concern and trust you for the things that are needed in my life that you have already prepared for me. You already have destiny worked out. You already have safety worked out. You already have covenant worked out. You already have provision worked out. You already have providential resources worked out in my life. All I need to do is to receive them as an act of your covenant with me. God, I pray these things expectantly in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, brothers and sisters, how do we know that this promise is true? Every time we have a message from God, we are offered an invitation, an invitation that allows us to draw closer to God. When we say the doors of the church are open, for most people that means an invitation to unite with the church. But the invitation is about more than just uniting with the church. That invitation is to go deeper and wider and higher in our relationship with God so that we can bear more fruit, so that we can be the recipients of the destiny, the safety, the covenant, the provision, and the providential resources that God has for us. So today, we invite you, wherever you are, to accept these invitations to grow deeper and wider in your relationship with God. You can call the church, you can reach out to other believers, read your Bible, and know that we at Grace are here to receive you and to help you make that journey. So live it, believe it, incorporate it, and trust that God's words are true. Amen. One of the great privileges we have as believers is a covenant known as Holy Communion, the Lord's Supper, the Eucharist. It is a time when we celebrate where God has caused us to live in remembrance of what God gives us as an act of knowing that we are forgiven for sin. So today we share in this act of Holy Communion. Hear these words of invitation. Christ our Lord invites all to his table who love him, who earnestly repent of their sins and seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, let us confess our sins before God and one another. Let us pray our prayer of confession and pardon. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors and we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were sinners. And that proves God's love to us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Brothers and sisters, hear now the Great Commission. Thanksgiving as we acknowledge what God has done for us. The Lord be with you and also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. 
And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you and blessed is your son Jesus Christ by the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and spirit. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread, gave thanks to you, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body which was given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples and said, drink from this, all of you. This is the blood of my new covenant, poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as oft as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your spirit make us one with Christ, one with each other and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your son Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy Catholic Church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Brothers and sisters, take the bread. This bread represents the body of Christ that's given for you. Take now and eat. Likewise, brothers and sisters, the cup representing the blood of Christ given for the remission of our sins. Take now and drink. The body and blood of Christ given for you for the remission of sins. As you partake of it, know that your sin has been forgiven. Now go forth in peace and may the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you now and always. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Now, brothers and sisters, go forth in the name of the Father and in the Son and in the Holy Spirit. We pray all these things in Christ's holy name. Amen.